There is so much passion on either side of the topic and seems to be no middle ground and virtually no humane conversations. Hi everyone, it's me again and Squish Gang is present. And today we are finally going to talk about evangelical Christian family vlogging channel, The LeBrant Family. And I'm sure by now, because I am slow to everything because I'm annoying, that other people have talked about it. But we're going to do my housekeeping first, if you don't care, uh, chapter video skip the intro. So I want to thank everyone for coming to my live stream. I had my I graduated university live stream the other day, which was really iconic. I had a really good time. I just like had White Claw reviews and played Among Us. So if you're into more like live streams and stuff, like let me know. I can probably try to do a couple of them a month just on like Friday afternoons or something for the chill vibes because I know I'm still small enough of a channel that I can interact with my audience directly. And I know people really appreciate that. I would also like if you liked, comment, and subscribed. I have a huge project coming up in the next month or so where I have some other creators in it and everything. I'm not going to make any promises or release any details because if it falls through, then I don't want to feel bad. Also, I opened up a Patreon. I'll link that down below. That was at request of a few people and also just like an idea that I had had kind of stirring around. I want to do channel memberships, but people said that they preferred Patreon, so that's what I did. There's three tiers. I priced them at US dollars just because they're... or comparable US dollar prices just because that's most of my audience is there. So there's Squish Clips, which is the $2 US, I believe, tier. And then I have a $10 US tier, which would be Patreon only live streams. And then I have a $15 US tier, which would be custom videos where I would literally make videos based on what the Patreon is looking for. That one, like I said, is priced kind of high just because videos take me six to 10 hours easily to make. So it's just because it's a lot of time. No pressure to do anything. Uh, that's just there for your desire if you so want. And then for the lowest tier, there is going to be, oh, the videos will, re will be released early, essentially as soon as I have them edited. And also I can potentially do a Discord. I haven't decided yet, but let me know that also. Any affiliate links or anything will be linked down below. Oh, and also I wanted to mention too that my Amazon wishlist will be open until the end of this week. So about April 14th, 15th, I'm going to just close it temporarily. So if there's anything you wanted to pick up or anything you want to peruse because I'm not going to link it in the next couple videos that will be down below because I'm moving soon so I don't want people to send me something uh and I can't receive it because I don't have forwarding mail because I don't even know who's going to live here after I'm gone. So, trigger warnings for this video we're going to have discussions of abortions, discussions of religion and choice, child exploitation as well as sick children. With the topic of the LeBrant family we obviously have a lot of sentiments of like issues with family channels and different sentiments that people have brought up many many times on other channels so I'm not going to go into that too in depth just because I feel like that is have been iterated many many times before and on this channel we believe in chronic uniqueness so we're not going to do that just because that's been mentioned before but i am i am going to go into a little bit of rhetoric as well as everyone enjoys on this channel which if you're new here that's what i do i talk about the rhetoric of different aspects of youtube content and different actions that people do for those of you who don't know rhetoric is the art of persuasion no i do not study psychology <laughs> just talking about different ways that people bring forth internet personas and make arguments in their videos or presentations so part one who are the LeBrand family? Part two, point by point analysis of their documentary, which I'll put the thumbnail up here. And part three, rhetoric focus and the arguments of their video specifically. So now we can finally get into part one. Who are the LeBrand family? So the LeBrand family is a typical like squeaky clean family channel, except that this one is like fundamentalist Christian, it seems. And they make a point to be particularly religious. If you look in their um, banner, on the channel banner, there is like literally a Bible verse in it. Which one? I don't remember because I'd never read the Bible, so I don't really pay attention to those types of things. Most popular video on their channel, though, has over 100 million views. Do y'all know how many semesters of university I could pay for with 100 million views? Anyways, I also don't have kids to exploit, though, so I guess it's not going to work for me now, is it? Uh, so yeah, the most video, most popular video on the channel has over 100 million views. It is called Four-Year-Old Girl and Daddy Do Cutest Carpool Kid karaoke ever oh my god carpool karaoke um yeah i don't know it actually made me genuinely uncomfortable looking through their videos and looking through their channel just because it was so obviously centered on their kids in like a pretty predatory way i find they also have a toy review channel for their daughter for their daughter whose name is allegedly pronounced everly <laughs> i think my i think the funniest thing i found when looking up this stuff was that like they have every like stereotype 
<laughs> of like a Christian-y family channel or like white suburban family channel where it's like big house that's like too white and doesn't look lived in exploiting their children and thumbnails and clickbaiting them and also having like there's like that meme of like that lady who has all the like kids names on it if I find it, I'll put it up here and they're all spelt really weird uh, Everly I, I would assume this is like Scottish or Irish or something but it's just so funny why don't you just spell it Everly like E-E-V-R-L-E-E -E -E or something like that because, like, when I was reading, I was like, is that ever Leia? Like, what is that? But anyways, I just thought it was kind of funny. I want to try to add a little bit of humor and a little bit of, like, kind of more happy nature into this video just because I feel like this one's going to be rough uh, when it's getting deeper into the content. So usually with these types of channels have been discussed at length, like I mentioned before. This channel is a particularly bad one. Essentially, every single thumbnail has the kids in it. And I'm not even, I don't even want to show them. I don't know how to blur on my video editor. I guess I can just try to, like... I don't know, pop like emojis over their faces or squishmallows or something just because it's like I I don't want to show I want to show my point without showing the kids because I don't want to use their kids for clicks and that's why I never made a video on which we'll talk about too the family the, because the family is famous for clickbaiting they clickbaited their daughter having cancer and I never made a video on that because I don't want to exploit anyone's children for views I don't, I find I'm not attempting to be exploitive ever, by the way, nor do I wish to be exploitive in any way, but I didn't want to have a video based on, like, children, which is why, too, my Ace Family video is actually focused on, like, Austin McBroom's and Catherine McBroom's dynamic as a family, not as much on, like, kids and the kids' content. So the thumbnails, like, they have the kids posing for them, for sure. It's interesting, because as we've seen with that, there was another family channel recently where the lady had her son, like trying to make him cry more so that he could pose for the thumbnail for their like a video when their dog was sick or something like that so it's like they're kind of doing the same thing where they have like they have the kid kind of going like this like my kelly culkin home alone like is that too much of it's a boomer is that a boomer reference i don't know that video is like that movie is like 20 years old you can tell my vibes are a lot more relaxed now that i'm not in school right from or like two weeks off of school before i started grad school they had the kids posing they had the kids like scream literally scream crying in some of the thumbnails and they went as far as clickbaiting the child having cancer and pranking the daughter saying they would have to take the dog away uh, they couldn't take care of the dog anymore so the title of the video with the child like the uh, clickbaiting of the kid being sick was actually called she got diagnosed with cancer in parentheses documentary and if you know what documentary we're going to be talking about today it seems like every time they put documentary in parentheses it is super bad news <laughs> originally it had a different thumbnail too and then after backlash they actually changed it which is really interesting um so obviously they're like aware to some extent they have they can't you know claim any sort of ignorance so that's what makes like this documentary even worse and the video did not like kind of show who was sick until a few minutes in and it turns out it was other people's kids so now they've gone actually further to exploit other people's children for their game thanks family channels very cool i despise you kind of low-key allegedly but why well, don't listen and the worst part is their daughter they have another daughter who is like who is sick for a super long time posey i didn't write the kids name i'm trying to avoid talking about the kids ah, but they have another daughter who like gets sick a lot and so then when people saw that thumbnail and that comment or that um title i watched tozy's video on it which i'll link down below but he talks about how like they said it as a premiere so you actually had to watch it like because like, premieres if you don't know are set like live streams where you the creator can come in and like comment with people as it airs i might premiere this one actually just so i can like because i actually have time to they premiered a video with the weirdest title and thumbnail possible i mean it is why would you do that for extra views? It, it does not make sense. It's just, it's so sleazy and slimy. But the video was titled, She Got Diagnosed With Cancer, with the thumbnail of the family. So everyone thought that someone in the family got diagnosed with cancer. And obviously their fans were freaking out and they thought it was one of their kids by the name of Posey because apparently she's had a whole history of medical problems. If you're unfamiliar with how YouTube's premiere feature works, essentially it allows YouTubers to, I guess, schedule videos ahead of time. So then the fans can see, oh, that's when that video drops. So essentially you see the thumbnail and the title of the video and then the date for whenever it releases. So for hours, all the subscribers saw was this thumbnail and this title that's a really sleazy way to get some extra views there's like you have to watch it all the way through like a live stream you can't kind of stop and skip and kind of look around so then people are just waiting to try to figure out what's going on so then that was like a super twisted way to like gain launch uh watch time on their videos now we're going to get into part two which is the big precipice of this whole thing which is their documentary about terminating pregnancies so they start by saying that is the most polarizing civil rights argument since 1970. 
civil rights movement was a weird way to call it. Maybe they're right in that. I don't know, but I thought that was very bizarre. Also, I feel like that's kind of reductionist of like movements of, you know, refugees and different, you know, trying to get like equality for women in general. But the whole framing of this was very manipulative and very toxic and very fundamentalist uh, religious, but in like the worst way possible. Because I want to preface too, I don't care if you're Christian. I don't care if you're Muslim. I don't care if you're Jewish. I don't care if you're Buddhist. I don't care if you're, if you practice Taoism. Like, I don't, it's not, the, the idea of being religious is not my problem. My idea, my issue here is being manipulative of a toxic set of systems within the religious structure and imposing that upon other people. That's what this is at its, like in the, the sugar, most sugar coated way possible, arguably. Because then it immediately takes the, why can't we approach this with love? Now, I find that this is a sentiment I, f I see on the right quite a bit when they know that they're trying to infringe on people's rights. <laughs> like, I recall, like, when they talk, when, you know, if you know those, like, BYU interview TikToks, where they go and they ask people, like, do you believe in, like, gay rights? And they'll go, like, well, I mean, why can't we just, like, approach the conversation with love? Like, why can't we just, like, you know, just not and put it on to anybody else it's the term approaching it with love is a way of saying like do not antagonize other people or do not attack other people or be mean to other people but when those other people are saying that there should be an infringement on rights it's kind of a weird sentiment to take because god forbid you told them pun intended i suppose that they couldn't go to church do we not remember when covid closed the churches infringing on rights can only be done with love when it is under their parameters and within their own desires i'm gonna be very based in this video i'm <laughs> oh boy all right next is the worst part of the video and they so they, this is like 30 seconds in like they come in strong um it made me sick it made me sick i was on discord call when i was watching this like i was like scripting the video and i literally like so, i like blew air into the microphone so loud that like everyone yelled at me <laughs> like everyone like <laughs> like in like a sigh i was because i was just like what so essentially they make a set of numbers okay of like supposed like you know death counts if you will talking about different um genocides and different events like tragic events and they add in the holocaust and they add in the rwandan genocide and amongst a few other things and then they throw abortion at the end there is so much passion on either side of the topic and seems to be no middle ground and virtually to show that it's the highest. So there's multiple things wrong with this on a rhetoric aspect. For one, because I'll get into that, I'll get into that part like after, but abortion is over all time. All of these other things are over a subset of years. And this is not even an attempt to reduce anything. It is not even an attempt of uh, to say that these things weren't tragic and, ton and, and, and millions of lives weren't lost. That's all what I'm saying. But I'm trying to show you right away the predatory framing that they're putting forward here, right? So they're doing like an amount set of things of all time, which again is also approximated, give or take, plus not even related to the type of thing because I'm wondering as under what circumstances are they um, putting in these parameters of these numbers too right so then they're trying to make these comparisons also sentience is another one a uh, pretty important thing to bring in here sentience is kind of important uh because those people that you know were in the concentration camps were aware and suffering throughout that time before they often were uh killed so you're comparing sentient people and sentient comprehension over uh, to something that is a lot of the time terminated when it's such an early point that there's essentially very little uh, life there, right? Because then Savannah LeBrant, which is the wife, says that people abort children because it's too hard. That's the only, like, that's like the reason, like, she's like, oh, people get rid of their babies because it's like too hard. You know, not that like, so they talk about like mothers who are like raising kids in their cars and people that are like struggling so hard but had the kids anyways do you not they never once bring forth and i'm not saying these people are bad mothers actually i think they were really good mothers a lot of the time these uh, people that were there interviewing but do you not think it's a disservice to the children to some extent to have such non-ideal conditions to raise them in if they could 
choose not to do that. But the reason they didn't was because they were coerced into carrying out the pregnancy. Because a lot of this, these conversations they have sound like they're coercion of like a set of structures and values of like the church and the people that they're around that kept them in this mentality of like keeping the children better to raise children in a more ideal and and consistent and structured environment to be coerced into not doing that because of you know certain things and then they base this whole documentary on anecdotal evidence of people who got out of things not talking to people who never did people who um you know gave up their kids and then they ended up in a bad foster home because that happens a lot They had one person, they had Cola Brandt's grandmother who was adopted. And it was like, oh, I had an amazing family. That doesn't always happen. They're setting up this like idealistic form just based on anecdotal evidence, which is just such a piss off, (laughs) to be honest. When you're talking about something so serious and you're like, and they're trying to, they're trying to hedge their arguments too. They're like, well, we're not saying we should make it illegal. We're just trying to show you like the opposite end of the choice, which is interesting because that's not, not like that's like the most enforced part and has been for hundreds of years. Like, it's not like, you know, the Christian ideology of, of, of uh, terminating pregnancies has not been like the forefront of most conversations since like forever. It's such a privileged position to be putting onto other people and arguing that that privileged position is silenced i mean not even three points in yet girls they compare yeah deaths from accidents heart disease to uh terminations of pregnancies citing that what they want to do is intervene the church and save babies i'll just leave it i'll leave that i'll leave that there uh because i already went i already ranted about this just like 30 seconds ago they found a doctor who says life begins at conception like fertilization or whatever that life began at a certain point then abortion should be allowed before that point and not allowed after in your professional opinion when when would you say life begins it's such a simple question with such a complicated answer Mm -hmm. a human egg is fertilized by a sperm and that is a single cell organism that has a unique genetic makeup that is the first so at fertilization you have a living cell that has that unique genetic pattern so on that basis, human life begins at fertilization. Never do they mention another doctor that like disagrees with that. They have like two doctors, I think. They have one who's like, who does abortions, who had an abortion herself and was like, I don't really regret it. So that was weird that they tried to spin that one. But regardless, they found one doctor who said later that he's a pro-life doctor. And I don't know about y'all. But if I had an OBGYN or like a specialist like that, that was like overtly against doing the procedures that he's doing, would I not want to do that? I don't think I would want to do that. Rise, I would do my best to understand her situation by talking with her, understand what was driving her to that decision. I understand that you're worried about finances and I understand that you're worried about your education and I understand that you're worried about the impact on your life in the future. I understand that you may not feel able to provide for your son or daughter in the future. But I want you to understand one thing. There is something that only you can give your son or daughter, and that is a chance to live, the very same chance that you have, to enjoy life. Only you can provide that to them. I don't think I would want that doctor. That's just me. And I'm not judging anybody, but I'm just like, that's weird. (laughs) That's weird to me. Like, imagine you have, I got, let's say I have asthma, right? And let's say I'm going to get my like prescriptions, like my pharmaceutical prescriptions, and I'm running my tests and stuff. And I have a doctor who's against cortical steroids, which is like the base medication that most people take. I wouldn't want an anti-cortical steroid doctor who's going to prescribe me my cortical steroids. Like, it's just weird to me. That's like counterintuitive, I feel like. And then, yeah, they proceed to like describe abortions in like the most gruesome way they're like oh break apart the babies and we like take out pieces of them one by one and all this and all this like this these descriptions and stuff and they never so like the doctor too like the pro-life doctor whatever describes like the c-section as this like super easy process and says that like and compares it to like the simplicity of a terminating process but like c-sections they like take out your organs (laughs) Like, they, like, plop out your intestines onto a table. It's not a, a, with, like, a three, four-week recovery time minimum, eight weeks before you can do any sort of, like, physical activity. So if I work, like, a service job and I got to run around all the time and I have a C-section, 
and you're in a country like the United States where you can't have maternity leave, how is that supposed to affect you? Like, do you see how I can, like, so easily present arguments to, like, every counterpoint they're making that doesn't even make sense? It's just so nuts. So they want to dispute the idea of pregnancy termination saving lives. It talks about delivering instead uh, when there are complications. So, like, he's saying, like, um, most of these complications occur 22 weeks or further where the pregnancy is viable. So then we choose often to deliver the baby. And then he says cesarean. And he's like, oh, I can do that in, like, an hour. Again, not mentioning, like, the insane recovery time, the complications. Uh, like, the fact that they take out your organs. <laughs> like... Maybe they don't always do that, but when I was like, I like looked, I googled, I look around at the pictures and they're like pulling stuff out. It's not like they're cut, they're, they're doing like a full incision. Like the, the terminations of pregnancies is like a little claw and like a little vacuum-y type thing or it's a pill. It's like, it's way less invasive procedures here. Then they begin to, with this doctor saying like, oh, delivering the baby, blah, blah, blah. Then they start bringing in like regret statistics. So I look, I have, so because I go to university, right? Or, so, I'm still a student at the University of Waterloo until, I want to say, May 1st, something like that. And I'm a student, a future student at McGill anyway, so I have access to that library too. So, I was like, let's use, let's use some of our codes. Because what happens, right, when you look up articles, like, uh, paywall articles, often universities have access to them. So, I was like, let's take a peeky-poo and what's going on. And I found through a bunch of papers, which I can't actually bring forth because that's technically commercial use of the library, which I'm not allowed to do. But regard to point short is there's a lot of studies by like the American National uh, Journal of Medicine and stuff like that that say it's five percent regret rate of terminating a pregnancy. Okay, so then I was like, well, what's the regret rate of having a kid? In contrast to that, and it says it sits anywhere from I want to say it's seven eight to seventeen percent. What number is bigger than five? Eight to seventeen. If you look at Christian sources, which are also behind a paywall or behind an account build, often are stating that it's upwards of almost forty percent. So the and the only sources that I could find disputing the five percent upwards to maybe fifteen percent if we're being generous were always Christian sources. Now Again, am I trying to say that Christians are evil or whatever? No. But I'm saying they're picking, they're cherry picking from their own community, from their own structured audience for what they are determining to be a good argument in this case. So again, look, I hate that like the all these are all these articles are behind paywalls because people like me could just go tick 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 and find everything. And I know that's not the case for a lot of people. If you know people that are in school and stuff too, you can always ask them to like see if they can read it, right? Um, cause it's, it's, like I said, the only sources I could find that had super high regret numbers were always like Christian education or Christian studies of blah, blah, blah. Like it was always, it's just interesting to have that contrast present and you can see what angle and what approach they're taking the LeBrand, excuse me, the LeBrand family in this documentary. And then the rest of it was just stupid. They had this like, em they just kept talking about Embrace Grace, which is like this, like essentially this, uh, company that convinces you to have kids, which I don't like that <laughs> as a concept and they really villainized uh planned parenthood too you know as like the evil like making you your get, get rid of pregnancy place even though they do tons of other stuff like you know birth control and um sti testing and so many other things and they're like hey planned parenthood blah, blah, blah. embrace grace good planned parenthood bad which is uh, like the reason why these pregnancies have to be terminated in the first place is because y'all don't respect places like Planned Parenthood or don't respect things like sex education. So I'm getting grumpy now. So let's get to part three where I get to read from my books. So for the rhetoric section of this, I highlighted like specific sections of the video that I wanted to talk about, which I've kind of ranted about a lot <laughs> already, but we'll get to some like cited stuff because, you know, I cite my sources and I don't make a random girl from Canada try to find where your statistics are from through some Google searches at midnight on a Sunday, <laughs> you know, God's day, right? Uh, anyways, so I found some sources here and some different things. So I want to start with the why can't we approach this with love comment. So the rhetoric of language is a choice. And with this and saying the word love in this way, they are bringing forth what's called ambiguity. Now, ambiguity is the same in rhetoric as it is in everything else, which is essentially just like unclear. Like you're, you're, you're being unclear on purpose and you're choosing to kind of confuse people in the process of doing things. Now, for this one, we have ourselves the 
So we're talking about rhetorical ambiguity, okay? The essential guide to rhetoric is what we're using. I have cracked out three books for these people. <laughs> so like, I'm going hard today, okay? As we mentioned earlier, speaking to an audience involves contingency. That is, it is dependent on the audience reaction. This occurs because any of the speaker's words or sentences can be taken in a number of ways. Speakers therefore must choose their rhetorical language carefully so the audience correctly infers their intention. How can we move from straightforward to rhetorically effective language? Here are some elements to consider. And I'm gonna, so they just have word meaning. Uh, when we think about language communications, we often start by considering what words mean, right? Which is functions and symbols. Multiple meanings. When a word has multiple meanings, this is called uh, polysemy. Polysemy. I never know how to pronounce that word. <laughs> that was the same thing I had problems when I was uh, taking my rhetoric course. I have trouble pronouncing that word. Which just means that there are multiple meanings uh, to certain words, such as like the word bank, which in the case of this is not relevant. However, ambiguous meaning is where the relevancy comes in. So it says, when grammar is ambiguous, this is known as... So when grammar is ambiguous, this is known as amphiboly. Consider the sentence, visiting elements, visiting relatives can be boring. It could mean either that you don't like to visit your relatives or that you don't enjoy when they visit you. Complexity of language can be both a benefit and a danger to speakers. It's a benefit because it offers many ways to get a point across and many options for expression to suit a given audience or purpose. The danger is the risk of using vague or inaccurate terminology, thus important to choose language carefully and appropriately. So they're choosing to be ambiguous right because when you look at the video the comments are turned off i believe the like and dislike ratio was also turned off even though you can only see likes now right so what's happening is they are setting up things to there's they're saying to approach it with love so that they don't get backlash that is the only purpose that they're doing this for they don't give a shit if you love them or they don't care they don't love you <laughs> like, they don't give a shit about you so the thing that the thing is happening essentially is they're trying to say that we need to approach it with love so to avoid backlash to them so that if people say hey you're being manipulative or you're kind of uh, enacting a um, you're enacting your point based on coercion and, and uh, you know systemic problems that have affected many people poorly and they go mm, can we approach it with love it's just a reductionist term just to kind of avoid, make people avoid any sort of criticism to them. So then we get to the statistics comparisons from the beginning of the video where they essentially compared terminations of pregnancies to a huge set of really tragic events. So we're going to assume that if they're facing backlash for the comparison, that they're going to say that they're not doing that comparison outright. They're like, well, we just want to show like when a lot of people pass away. Right? They're going to attempt to hedge their argument. I've talked about hedging a lot of times before, which is when you go like, well, I didn't know I did that. It's just pleading ignorance, right? So they created what's called a rhetorical comparison. Rhetorical comparison is defined as like a placement of two or more elements together tied to a common theme. To which the common theme here is the amount who passed away because that, that's the set of numbers that they're putting in. To end it with terminations of pregnancy is doing a multitude of things. For one, it is comparing the... It is trying to make it seem worse than the tragedies that they're placing it with. It is saying that all of these values are of the same gravity and the same relevance to the other values. So, so they're essentially saying like any abortion ever done is killing people, right? And then they're going another step further and essentially saying that it is like the worst of all these things by putting it at the end and by putting it at the highest volume. So if they're going, there's no pleading, if, if they plead ignorance, play the video to me. <laughs> Give them my video and be like, you know, I have a degree in this now, literally. So fight me. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> okay, so then we're going to get to the element of regret, okay? So interviews with people who are saying that they regretted terminating their pregnancy, they again pair this with really gruesome imagery of the termination process. And you know that this is an interesting comparison because then they say, like I said, that doctor said that the cesareans are easy procedures. So he's saying it's essentially that's easier to give birth than to not, which is literally not true. Like, that's just not true. <laughs> like, because like not only is like giving birth like an insane process, you have the kid after. Even if terminations were like this like crazy medical procedure with like months of healing, you're not healing and having to take care of a child. And also, then they don't have, you don't have to pay for that child, right? And it's, and for a lot of people too, if you terminate, you can still potentially have kids later in your life because a lot of these terminations too are with young adults. So it's just, 
these com- these setups that they're doing are just incredibly predatory and just gross. The documentary functions through what's called, I would call like yeah, anecdotal evidence with some appeal to emotion fallacy tossed in and some religious based manipulation just kind of sauced on the top. Salt bait right on the bloop, 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 bloop. Now we're going to use our second book from the roster, which is the um, Elements of Rhetoric. For whoever purchased this for me on my Amazon wish list, please make yourself seen. Very iconic. Um, I didn't get the little piece of paper with the little with this book, unfortunately. So, all right. So this says match means to an end. Once you've established your end, whatever you wish primarily to teach, please, or move, you can turn to technique. Here enters a complicating factor. You are not the only party involved. To get a complete picture of your talk's objectives, you must broaden your view to inc- include the audience's perspective. After all, if the room were empty, why would you open your mouth? To match means to ends pays your respect to what is called the communication triangle. It's a device for clarifying your end, de- uh, and hence determining your methods on rhetorical techniques. Based on the observation, that goes back to Aristotle's rhetoric. Aristotle's advice for determining the content of your speech, your delivery, and your device is to look at your audience. As he wrote, the hearer determines the speech, the speech's end or object. He does not mean that a speaker must act like a paid client. Rather, the hearer determines your end in as much as the hearer whom you wish to teach, please, or move. So I'm determining their end because they can't control the audience's perception. They do not have control over the minds of the people who are watching it, no matter how much they, they wish to manipulate, right? And I am saying that this end is an attempt to reinforce, I would arguably, fairly toxic fundamentalist Christian values upon all audience that they can reach with their gig- with their huge subscriber base. And they are trying to coerce women into keeping pregnancies that they don't want and thus creating a world of arguably children that people may or may not regret. And... I don't think that's a good thing. And that's just my opinion. Take with that what you may. So then we go into the Christian sources dispute, uh, disputing thing that I was talking about before. So the audience is centered around Christians and thus is blatantly and blissfully ignorant of other perspectives. Neglect post, there's neglect of post-birth health effects. There is neglect of the health of the, from these um, cesarean procedures, for example. There is neglect of the adoption system and how it is oversaturated. There is a neglect of the foster system. There is neglect of the National Library of Medicine that has the child neglect or the regret of having a child actually higher then the neglect of or the they are ignoring the National Library of Medicine that says the regret of having kids is actually higher than often the termination of France because you shouldn't just I don't know about y'all but I don't think you should just have kids willy nilly like I feel like that's not a good idea <laughs> like because kids are shaping the next generation the world is in a very contentious position and to be economically mentally and physically stable uh, is very helpful for raising children is it necessary in all cases no it's not but it would definitely help and i think to negate that through the means of something like embrace grace just being like well we'll just make you want to do it is uh dangerous i think arguably uh, to a certain extent so they make their point through what's called a rhetorical commonplace now this is going to be from the book landmark essays of contemporary rhetoric whoever got this for me very iconic. I did not get the slip with it. So if you don't mind, like make yourself known if you wish. The rhetorical commonplace is described as such from the essay Creativity and the Commonplace by Richard McKeon. It says the following. That creativity takes its beginning in the commonplace may be taken as a familiar and accepted commonplace. Invention, discovery, and insight are creative modes of departure from accustomed circumstances of the commonplace to transform the customary or the unnoticed novelties. Widely known and authoritatively established as novelties in turn become commonplaces to provide circumstances and subject for new innovations. Such commonplaces of common opinion and ordinary language, however, are exactly are examples of the changes and alterations which can be commonplace undergoes. Both creativity and the commonplace are ambiguous where are ambiguous words. Places, topics, loci, commonplaces, and proper places have had long paradoxical history since they have entered the language of the West. They are ambiguous in the ordinary Greek as they are in ordinary English. And the nature of place and space were a subject and dispute of the Greek physical science. This is just talking about how, like, even then, the idea of what is known as a commonplace is not even super clear, but is essentially a structure of different opinions, systems, and locations and viewpoints. They have kind of 
grappled with the idea of the commonplace with trying to establish a common opinion through their audience and this idea of their very cherry picked information that makes it seem like they've done all this research and they're doing the side that's not listened to despite the side that has had a lot of influence and you can and that is undeniable when you're looking at the recent laws being passed in the United States and in places like Texas. They're trying to make the primary side seen as the one that is unheard and because it is the most popular side it actually has the most people in it and are thus structuring that upon a commonplace. So that's why the video is terrible. Point 3000 at this point. So I'm going to conclude there, I think, just because I've gone on and on and on. I've been recording for a long time. I just want you to know th several things. If you're religious, I don't care if you're religious. It's totally fine. Two, just please don't reinforce and oppose systems that are toxic to other people upon them, whether you agree with them or you don't. Three, LeBrant family, not a great source to learn these things. If you choose to kind of delve into this, I would read actual peer review sourced things. Even I'm not necessarily a good source. However, at least I do understand like research and functioning within that realm. But a couple of YouTube fam uh, YouTube family that click their kid getting sick is not the place to get your information from, I think. And overall, um, I wouldn't watch it because you're going to then be supporting anti- or anti-pro-choice organizations or like pro-life organizations so i would stray away from that if that's not something you're into um there are lots of people who talk about the video and actually i even remember jacqueline glenn i watched most of her video the, the last night she actually alleges that they might be even sponsored by embrace grace which would make this so much worse so you know take with that what you will and this was just a wild ride for me and uh, you guys have a good day. And I'm sorry the Discord keeps... I can't make the sound go away, trust me. Or it makes my microphone won't read properly. It's a whole thing. Anyways, you guys have a great night wherever you are. And I'll see you when I see you. Bye. Let me just remind you of this. You will never be so down that you can't pick yourself back up. Period.